Great. Well, thank you so much, Sophie. It's just genuinely such a pleasure to follow her. I work quite closely with Sophie, um, so that's that's really lovely for me. Um, hello. Thank you again for coming out today. Really, really appreciate it. I am Sally Late. I am Sally Late on Twitter if you want to ask me any questions, but since the matter of otter gifts has been thrown out there, I will also accept otter gifts. Uh, you can also grab me. I'll stick around for a little bit afterwards if you've got any questions. I'm an engineering manager at Monzo, and uh, I work specifically as the engineering manager partner for COPS Collective, which Sophie's just been talking a little bit about. And I'm also the EM partner for Web as a Discipline at Monzo. And what I'd like to talk today is about the role that technology can actually play in terms of social inclusion and what that means for us as a bank. So who here is familiar with our No Barriers to Banking campaign? Hopefully, yes, yeah, some. Okay, if you haven't checked that out, have a look. Um, there's some really great work being done there. Uh, when we announced this earlier this year, we actually focused quite a lot in terms of the, the site and what we're talking about. Um, we focused on the features that we think can make a real difference to some of the underbanked in this country. And so those are things like being able to register using a shelter or a friend's address and our commitment to always using simple language wherever possible. And those features do play a really, really important role, um, but it's kind of only one side of the story when it comes to inclusivity, because the technology that we use to actually create Monzo itself can play its own part. And it's that that I really want to talk about today. Now that we've reached the milestone of, of 2 million people, yay, and always onwards, um, we're more mindful than ever that all of our customers are very, very different. and you know, as well as people's own situations and, and them as people, we've got our own preferences. So most of you in here will probably have different preferences in terms of the devices you use, screen sizes, things like that. And as you've probably seen from our recent TV adverts, we're also doing our banking in newer places and, you know, all kinds of incredible situations um, all the time now. So if we don't work, uh, if we don't build things that work for people in these different kind of situations, then we could unintentionally end up being really hard to use or excluding people. So I'm gonna start by sharing some of the ways that technology can actually play a role in inclusivity. And I'm gonna finish up by explaining some of the things that we're doing at the moment to try to be better at some of these. So to frame it, as I mentioned, I am the EM partner for the web as a discipline. And so I'm gonna be using the web again as a basis for some of the examples of what can go wrong if you're not focusing on the right things. And most people, when they think of Monzo, they, they still think of our apps, and we are very app-based. We're going to continue to be very app-based. Um, that's not changing. But we have a number um, of web-based elements, which not everybody seems to know about. So we've got our marketing site, monzo.com, and the blog, and all the things around there. Um, we also have got campaigns. So you might have seen Year in Monzo, which was accessed through the app, but it was actually built using web technologies. And then we've got things like our emergency banking app which allows people to do a sort of a subset of activities on their account uh, through a web-based interface. And then, of course, we've got our internal tools, which Sophie has told you a little bit about. And so with all of these creations, there are some principles that can apply to each one of them in different ways. The first one that I want to talk about a little bit is accessibility. Now, accessibility is very often considered to be just about disability, um, just about people who can't do things. But actually, if you're building in the right way, it can mean that you create products that have a much stronger foundation and are actually inclusive um, for the majority of us. So there's a, a nice little definition here um, from Wikipedia. Um, but what you should be really mindful of is that uh, you know, not everybody basically experiences the web in the same way. So some people might be using screen readers. Others might uh, use you know, assistive technologies. They might interact with a mouse or voice uh, or keyboard, things like that. And this thing about having equal access down the bottom, this is at the heart of it. We want everybody to be able to use Monzo in the same way. And some people might have uh, different situations in terms of their accessibility needs. So some of those might be permanent. And you've got um, some really nice examples down the left there. And it might be things like not being able to see subtle con uh, color contrast, uh, having some kind of color blindness, as well as the other examples there. Or they could be impaired by temporary situations, uh, such as having an injury, 
or it could be situational. It could be very transient, coming and going. So even people who don't necessarily consider themselves to have a particular disability or an accessibility requirement, they can have um, situational needs. And one that always comes to mind for me is when you're on a train and you're playing a video, you don't want people to hear the noise blaring out. So that's why we've done things like make a big effort to start to put captions on the videos that we're creating. So if you're interested more in this, uh, this is taken from the Microsoft Inclusive Design Toolkit. So they've got some really nice resources. But generally, when we create things that aren't designed and built with people's different situations and needs in mind, then we run the risk of at best creating annoyances and at worst actually kind of being unusable or even causing people harm. The next thing I want to talk about is performance. So when we talk about performance, we're usually referring to things like how fast or how efficiently software can work. And the performance of web creations can, again, have a big impact in terms of inclusivity. Now, I've tried to keep this very high level. I'm sorry. I saw lots of people taking uh, photos of the tech stack before, so this is even more simplistic. Um, when we put together web pages, in case you don't know, what we're doing is we're essentially kind of creating together, uh, collecting together a set of different resources and different files that people need to put together to be able to see the page as intended. So if our page is crammed full of videos or images or code that isn't necessarily as well considered as it could be, then we can end up in a situation with what we consider to be a large page size. Larger pages can take longer to download. Um, especially if you're on a slow connection. And what they can also do is they can take up more of people's data plans. And this can be particularly harmful to people who um, can only afford limited data. So if they're perhaps on a prepaid plan or something like that, or if they're maybe in a situation where data is particularly expensive. So if you've gone abroad and your data is not covered in that situation. Another performance consideration is when we create digital products that require lots of effort from our devices to run, um, usually because they're doing lots and lots of processing. And so by creating things that only the, the most high end, the latest devices can handle, then what we're doing is we're excluding people on other devices. And there have also been a number of arguments made recently about how what we're actually doing as well is um, playing a part in reducing people's ownership cycles and contributing to waste and also contributing to overall energy consumption. So there's some bigger picture stuff here as well. Just to talk about devices a tiny bit more, it's really highly recommended. I hope you all keep your devices and your software and your browsers up to date generally. But realistically, we've all hit that snooze button and left it far too long. Uh, we know that doesn't always necessarily happen. So different web browsers, different devices, they have different capabilities. Older versions typically have many more limitations around certain aspects of displaying content or providing features. And Again, if you only ever create things for the absolute latest devices, you're again excluding a lot of people. There could be other situational reasons why people might not actually experience the, the visuals or the functionality that you've hoped for them. Um, if you can't load files well, so for instance, if your internet connection is slow or restrictions uh, or has restrictions, then the files might not download properly as you expect. There might be dependencies. And we often sort of think about slow internet in terms of things like developing countries and not something we get in London. But if we've been on train Wi-Fi or hotel Wi-Fi, then you can really easily get into this situation where stuff just doesn't work for you. So in the worst case, again, handling these situations poorly means that some people will be unable to get things to work and they just won't be able to use stuff. But instead, when we talk about the idea of progressive enhancement, what we're talking about is the concept of having the same base features that everybody can access and use and then layering on either fancy visual um, options or functionality, sort of interaction things, um, if the device supports them, basically. So at a minimum, everybody will still have the same access to the core functionality. So this is a really cliched analogy, but basically, if you had just a, a vanilla sponge cake with some white icing, you'd probably be pretty happy, I would. Um, the colors, they're a nice added bonus if your sort of device supports it in the analogy. And the same with the, the sprinkles on the top. They look pretty, they add maybe a bit of extra texture, but you're not losing anything if you don't really have them. So that's what we mean when we talk about progressive enhancement. So who here is from London? I'm imagining a lot. That's a yeah, fair few hands. Uh, who has not come from London? Come from somewhere with really, really rubbish mobile phone signal. 
few of you. I feel your pain, by the way. Uh, so as we've grown, we've really loved seeing where our customers are actually coming from. Um, I checked, we've got dashboards, we can look at all the information. So we've got Monzo card holders in the Outer Hebrides, in Truro, in tiny villages in Suffolk, which is me, uh, and obviously everywhere in between. And now we're gonna have new customers in the US, which is so exciting. So supporting a range of different kind of geographic and connectivity considerations can ensure that people um, can use your products wherever they happen to be, whatever they happen to be doing. And finally, as you might have seen from some of our blogs on the subject, we are really committed to increasing our levels of diverse, uh, diversity in many ways. And this is from our annual report, which came out just this week, so you can find that on our website. And part of trying to increase diversity is just because it's the right thing to do, to be representative. But when we think about it in the context of technology, um, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we've got a range of people in our teams responsibly building things that don't alienate or exclude anybody through lack of representation and therefore lack of awareness of issues. So this is something that we're really, really being mindful of. So ultimately, if we work to make appropriate decisions around technology to actually implement our products well, um, then we get the benefit of a bigger customer pool and our customers get the benefit of having these delightful products that meet all their needs. So it's really win-win in that sense. When we talk about customers, as we just heard, that actually extends to our internal customers too. Uh, because we build not just in terms of BizOps, uh, we build other web interfaces. So by thinking of some of those previous considerations, it lets us do things like potentially be a more inclusive um, employer, to have happier staff, um, and to do things like having faster loading screens can guard against frustration. It can help people get their job done quicker, hence you know, solving the, the ultimate end customer need, but also just removing those frustrations from somebody's life as well. So here's the inevitable twist. And we've talked a lot about transparency. Um, this is one of the things that we're not perfect at. We could do a lot more. And as we've been growing as a company, we've uh, felt a sort of growing sense of responsibility. I think it's fair to say in this area because we haven't always got this right. And we're aware that we sort of need to be very mindful of this and make some more improvements. Lots of them are very much tied into our overall company strategy. So in terms of diversity, that will be tied into our, our sort of overall hiring and recruitment processes, things like that. But there are these elements which are much more specific to uh, the web and engineering at Monzo. So focusing on the latter, here are a few things that we're really focusing on. So first things first, we're trying to understand better what needs fixing, what we need to get better at. So we've been doing um, audits, we've been looking at uh, what we found, we've been fixing some of those things. So for instance, one of the things we fixed recently um, is that we solve some of the more crucial accessibility issues on our help site and prioritize those. And that was actually prompted by a customer. So listening to you has always been a really, really big part of how we've grown, and we're going to keep on doing that. So we've got our sort of share with us feature, which we absolutely listen to. Um, but if you share things through other channels, we do feed those back in. So I wanted to include, this is our accessibility channel uh, as part of Slack. We run a lot of things through Slack. Um, this is where people sort of feed in customer requests. So if you want to share these things with us, they do get listened to and they can help us to build the case that we should focus on certain things. As we improve, our goal is that obviously the, the metrics will go in the right way, depending on what we're focusing on. Um, what we're trying to do is gather more of these metrics and hopefully make them a bit more visible across the company, but also potentially to share them um, more publicly so that you can see how we're doing and help us uh, stay accountable to that. But obviously fixing things after they've happened isn't as good as making sure that they don't happen um, in the first place. So we want to fix more at the root. And to do this or to help us do it, we've actually formed recently what we're calling a web platform team. And we're hiring for that uh, if anybody is interested. So we've already had platform teams across the, the rest of the business and um, kind of introducing this as the web discipline has matured has made a bit of sense. What it's doing is it's really helping us to drive standards and put in place some of the strong foundational tools and processes for web as a discipline that we need to make sure that we get this stuff right. So tools are things like automated checking um, into our deployment, uh, and, well, development and deployment processes um, for stuff like accessibility and performance. 
We're also trying to document some of our standards better. So we've got a document around accessibility, which covers things like how to report accessibility issues, team responsibilities, um, information on what the standards are, what we expect, and then guidelines on tools to use. But this is only one team. Um, so we want to also ensure that this good stuff filters out more widely. And to do that, we've got two really important aspects, which are sort of the learning side and the doing side. In terms of learning, we've got uh, a learning budget. So each of our engineers is given a thousand pounds and you can actually do whatever you want to do with that. So if you want to learn cooking or if you want to learn carpentry, you can do that. Um, but a lot of people use it in much more traditional ways to go to conferences, do courses, stuff like that. Um, so we, we encourage people to share what they learn with their peers. And we also try to find these opportunities uh, for people from Ondelance to learn from others as well. So we had a recent trip to the Government Digital Services uh, Accessibility Empathy Lab, I think they call it. So that's some of the people uh, sort of learning and, and experiencing that. But these people can then bring that newfound knowledge back. And what we do is we've got everything from kind of more formal knowledge shares in our all hands where people can stand up here and speak to the entire company. Um, but we've got lightning talks and we're proposing and um, there's going to be a sort of three part accessibility workshop that people might be able to go on. And we've also got a proposal uh, that we're writing around things like champions as well. So as our knowledge grows, we're really keen to share that both inside the business, but also outside, which is part of why I wanted to stand up here today and speak to you. Um, we're hoping to sort of publish more, to speak more and maybe even share some of our tools with um, wider digital teams. So finally, doing, um, whether we're building new things or actually making changes to what's in place, the way that we tend to do this is through a series of um, proposals. So these can be visible to the entire company. Uh, somebody will write a proposal, it can be open for comment, um, it can be critiqued and made better that way. And we really hope that that process can help us to gather a range of perspectives. So we want to make sure that these kind of considerations are always challenged if they need to be. And over time, we've been thinking a lot more about the kind of problems that I mentioned at the start. Um, we've been trying to create things that have these baked in. So an example here is actually the component library for all of the, the building blocks in BizOps, which Sophie just shared. Um, and this has been built to be accessible by default. And if you don't know about sort of component libraries, pattern libraries, um, you can sort of think of these a little bit like Lego bricks. So they are individual elements, so things like buttons that can then be put together to sort of combine into to bigger patterns and then eventually build out um, the software itself. So we're hoping to do lots more of this in the future. And of course, we're also gonna continue to look at how technology can help us to be more inclusive um, just generally. So like the work that we've done um, with the big issue. So I know that um, Paul who's worked on this and also the component library is at the back here. So shout out to Paul. Um, we wanna do more of this stuff. We wanna see how technology can actually drive us forwards. So there is a whole load more that we can do better, um, but I'm really proud to work for a company that is genuinely committed to being as inclusive as possible. Um, later this year, we're gonna be releasing a lot more exciting features. And with these, we're going to continue to be mindful of the role that technology can actually play in terms of social inclusion. And we're gonna work to make sure that our choices can make money work for everybody. So thank you very much. Again, my name is Sally. If you want to send me any questions, you're very welcome to do so.